So I thank all of you for coming here today evening. Om Gyan Tamirandasya Gyanam Nishila Kala Chakshurun Tamina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha So today I'll speak on the topic of using our intelligence to tap the power of our thoughts. Our thoughts are probably the things that are the closest to us. The Bhagavad Gita is an ancient text of yoga and it describes how our inner world works. And therein it explains that most of the distress that we experience in our life, it is not just because of what happens in the world. The distress we experience is because of how we interpret what happens in the world. For all practical purposes, we never interact with the physical world directly. We interact with the mental representation of the physical world. If I am in a desert and I see a mirage, actually at the physical level, there is only sand over there. But somehow it gets represented in my mind as a body of water. I start running after it. So we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we in, as it is interpreted by our mind. One of my early interests in school when I was, when I was, a, kid, when I was a kid was astronomy. So I used to go to the terrace of my house at night and sit with my telescope trying to look at the various celestial objects. So at one time I was eagerly waiting to look for a solar eclipse. And it is for days and days I've been planning and waiting. And then as a solar just before the event of the solar eclipse, something had happened and I was thinking about it. And as the eclipse started, I was looking through the telescope and after some time I realized the eclipse is over and I didn't see the eclipse only. Because my mind was caught in something else. So at that time I started, th started thinking that I'm so interested in what goes on up, out there in the sky. But what goes on here inside the head is also very interesting. Not interesting in the sense of being informative necessarily, but interesting in the sense of being captivating. That the eclipse is so poor, so beautiful or so awaited, but something came in my inside and that just riveted, riveted, dragged my attention away. So what actually happens? So what goes on inside us and how does it distract us? Actually, the Bhagavad Gita explains that we could understand our inner world by personification. Personification means that that which is an insentient object, we ascribe personal attributes to it. So for example, you may see the, the clouds are roaring. Now the clouds are insentient objects, they are just pouring water. But if there, there is a thunderstorm, you may see the clouds are roaring, that's personification. So the Bhagavad Gita says, we can personify our mind. That is, treat the mind like another person. And this person can be a friend or an enemy. Now what do we exactly mean by personifying? And before that, what do we exactly mean by the mind? So to understand this, let's do a quick thought experiment. So wherever you are seated, you can be comfortable and close your eyes. And with me, you can take three deep breaths. One, two, three. 
Now with your eyes closed, look at what you see in front of you. Because your eyes are closed, you can't see what is physically in front of you. But you still see something like an inner screen. And on that inner screen, we have, you may have, see various images. You may see this temple room, you may see your home, you may see your car, you may see your friend, you may see some garden or mountain you had seen recently, you may see a movie star or a sports star, or you may just see a dull, way, abstract pattern of colors. But still, there's an inner screen and you see something on that inner screen. Now, try to take a step back and look at who is looking at that inner screen. You can see the inner screen, but who is it that is looking at the inner screen? To spot that person, take a step back. Let's try once again. Take a step back to spot the inner seer. No matter how many times you step back, the inner seer steps back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. And you are the inner seer. You are the soul. And the inner screen is your mind. You can open your eyes now after taking one deep breath. Thank you. So, when normally we perceive things, there is the outer scene. Let's say you are looking at me, I am looking at you. So, the, the outer scene, there is the outer scene, there is the inner screen, and there is the inner seer. When all three come together, that is when perception happens. However, this inner screen doesn't always act as a window. It can sometimes act like a TV screen. And it can certainly start, suddenly start displaying maybe something which we had remembered long time ago, something that had happened to us many years ago or many months ago, or some future problem that may come in our life. Various things keep, keep getting displayed on the inner screen. And because this inner screen is so close to us, we tend to take whatever appears on it very seriously. We tend to identify with it. So now what appears on the inner screen we could say is a mental event. It's a stimulus that appears inside. We could call that as a thought. So a thought is an event that occurs inside us and it appears as an image or as a stimulus on the inner screen. The word thought can have two distinct meanings. One is, I had a thought. I just got a thought. That means some idea some uh, notion popped up within my mind. The other is, I have given this a lot of thought. So when I say I have given this a lot of thought, that means it refers to systematic contemplation on the subject. So first the word thought means an uh, event in our inner world. Uh, just a stimulus that pops up on the inner screen. And the second is a sustained reflection. So why, why are these two uh, meanings of thought relevant for us? Because lots of things keep coming on our inner screen. And we could say that this, the thought that come from the inner screen, they, when they come, because they're so close to us, often they're so vivid, that we take them very seriously. 
but not everything that appears on that inner screen needs to be taken seriously. Why not? Say, if we go to some public place, now we might that right now there might be 50, 70, 100 people here. Now, we can't meet everyone. We may want to socialize and meet as many people as possible. But if we go to a place where there are 5,000 people are there, how many of those people can we meet? We have to decide. This is the person I want. These are the people I want to meet. These are the people I want to spend some time with. And others we may just greet and we may move on. Hmm? So similarly, lots of thoughts pop up into us. Depending on how agitated or how calm we are, thousands of thoughts pop up within our, on our inner screen. We could say every few minutes, every hour, every hour. In a day, thousands upon thousands of thoughts keep popping up on the inner screen. And if we start paying attention to everything, we will be lost. So the Bhagavad Gita says that the thoughts that appear on our screen, they need to be processed. Prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava nadveshti sampravrittani manivrittani kamshiti udhasina vadhasina gunayyo navichayate gunavartanti deva yovatishtati nengate In 14th chapters, 22nd and 23rd verse, it says that when these thoughts come into your mind, come up in your consciousness, come inside us, just observe them. Do not resent them, do not crave for them. Just observe them and then evaluate them. Decide which need attention. Udasina vadasina. Be detached and observe them. So basically when a thought comes in our mind, uh, often we attribute four uh, qualities to the thoughts. We think they are true, that they are wise, they are important and they are urgent. We think that they are true. Say for example, you know, I get, I find a small swelling on my hand. A thought comes in. What if this is cancerous? What if you have cancer? Now once that thought comes in my mind, then I say, oh, it might really be cancer. I start Taking my thought, I think the thought is true, the thought is wise. So the thought is wise means we think the thoughts know what whatever thought is saying, do this, don't do this. We take it seriously. And not only that, it's important. It has to be paid attention to immediately. And that it is urgent. And it has to be that now. So because of attributing these four, we just by default do it. Because the thoughts come inside us. We don't very critically evaluate the thought. Say for example, after this program you go out and somebody comes and says, I want to talk with you. And then they look very serious. Okay, what do you want to talk? And we just go walk away with them and they take us away and they keep talking with us for six hours. And we may have a lot of plans, but we just get captivated by it. Sometimes, some people are very good storytellers. When they start speaking, they just magnetize people. And they enjoy telling the story and they enjoy an audience. Or they will speak to you for six hours and then at the end, if somebody comes and asks, so who is your new friend? They say, oh, sorry, what is your name? <laughs> so they don't really make friends. They just need an audience. Just need someone to hear what they are speaking. So similarly, for us, the thoughts that come within us, they come and then they start off a story. So we could say that our inner world, another example to use is, it's like a train station. And once I was in Mumbai, which is one, which is one of the biggest cities in India, and I had to go very, I had to go for an important meeting. And I just came to the station and I knew I was very late. And the train uh, was about to leave. So I just rushed and got into the train. 
in the nick of time. And then I was breathing heavily because I had somehow got into the train. And then I sat down and started planning for the meeting. And then half an hour went off and I was looking when the station coming. And then suddenly I realized a station which is very far away from my station, that was what is outside. Then I, then I asked what happened. And then I realized that I had got into the wrong train. I had got, come in such a haste, I had expected my train to be there on that station. But a train going in the opposite direction was there at that time. And the train which I was supposed to be there was late. So I just went off in the wrong direction. So similarly for us, we could say inside us, there are many trains of thought we take. Now, whichever train we get into, it just shoots off. <laughs> and as soon as it shoots off, it just takes us into a completely different place. So for example, you know, I may be in a very cheerful mood when I come to the office. And then suddenly, I see a strange look in my boss's eyes. And when I see that, immediately the worried train shoots off. So the worried train. Oh, why did my boss look at me like that? Is he planning to fire me? If he fires me, what will happen? How will I get another job? How will pay? I pay for my mortgage? If I can't pay for my mortgage, then I'm, I'll be evicted from my house. Now it's so difficult to get a good house. If I don't get a good house, I'll have to stay on the streets. Oh, it's so cold. How will I stay on the streets? Right now, I may be feeling cold because of the AC. But I'm thinking I'll be out in the cold. So from the stay, I was at one moment very cheerful. But just one stimulus that prompted me to get in the train of thought of worry shot off. And within a few minutes, I might be on the verge of a panic attack. So the states of mind can change very rapidly because inside us, there are many thoughts and thought patterns which are there. So to the extent we become observers, to the, rather than identifiers. If we just identify with these, then we get carried away by them. We don't, we don't have to identify with the thought. We need to identify the thought. Identify with the thought means there is a worry train, there is a thought, thought train of worry inside me. I get into it and I get worried. I, but instead, hey, this is the worry train. Do I need to get into this? No, I don't need to. So, a thought may be there over there, but it can't affect us unless we focus on it. Unless we go into it. The train won't move till we get into it. Similarly, it is our thoughts. that It is our... That, so, thought can refer to just a pattern, uh, just a stimulus on our inner screen. But when we get into it, when we think about it, that's when it gets energy, it becomes bigger. The nature of problems in life is that we all are going to have problems. But th this world itself is a place of problems. There is, next week we are having Narasimha Chiturdashi. So Prahalad is a great saint. And he says in one of his uh, prayers to the Lord that how distress is unavoidable in this world. Yasma triya priya viyoga sanyoga janna shokagrina sakala yonishida yamana dukkhaushidam tadapi dukkhamata diyaham vaman ramami vadame tavadasya yogam. So he says that in our life there is the palatable, there is a dis there, there are some things which, we, which are pleasant and some things which are unpleasant. Priya and apriya. And we want to unite with the desirable and we want to avoid the undesirable. But unfortunately, life does the opposite. The life unites us with the undesirable and separates us from the desirable. 
We like a friend very much and somehow that friend gets transferred somewhere else. We think in this team, I don't want to work with this person. And that person becomes a partner. So things happen in such a way that we get the unwanted, undesirable and the desirable goes away. And this causes distress. Shoka Agni. Now when this distress happens, you see, when anything bad happens in our life, the bad event is out there. It has happened. Okay, this person is a difficult person and I have to work with this person. Or say, you know, I wanted to go out for outing and I have fallen sick. I got flu just the previous night. It's a bad event that has happened. But how bad it, how badly it will affect us depends on how much we dwell on it. So if I fall sick, if I get flu, now having a flu is not a very painful condition. It is I feel weak, I feel sleepy, maybe I feel dizzy, I so lie in bed. But inside me, there's a constant replay going on. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? You know, all my friends are enjoying in the outing. I'm here, just languishing in the bed. And that hurts us much more than the flu. So resentment of reality often hurts much more than reality. I have to work with some difficult person. I have to deal with uh, some, I have to deal with the situation. But when we keep dwelling on it, that's what hurts us much, much more. I correspond with a lot of people on email. I'm a writer and I connect with people in different parts of the world. So last year when I was in America, the one person from India had written a mail to me that had infuriated me. And I, I was giving a talk in Washington, D.C. And after that talk, uh, many people would come to talk with me after the class. And uh, after having spoken in public for 20, 25 years, we can it, we get some ability to discern. Some people ask questions to gain knowledge. And some people ask questions to show knowledge. So sometimes the, the question they ask will go on for 10 or 15 minutes. So then if that is happening, if you start seeing that, then we just politely try to end the conversation and move on to some other people who are more interested. So as I was trying to disentangle myself from a conversation that was going nowhere, it just struck me that, see here, I am not ready to spend more time than necessary with this person. But there that person is in India and I am giving so much of my mental time to that person. You know, why did you like that? Why did you like that? Why did you like that? Sometimes when we quarrel with someone, we say, I won't talk with you. Now we say, I won't talk with you, but our mind keeps talking with that person. How dare you do this? How dare you do that? How dare you do that? And actually, we give that person a lot of time. And at least if we talk, talk calmly, there's some chance of clarification. But in our mind is just hurling curses at that person. What do we get by it? Nothing. It's just that we become more and more agitated. So the point I'm making here is that the bad things happen. That's just the nature of life. Sometimes the undesirable happens and the desirable doesn't happen. But when this happens, it is how much is it replayed on the mind? That determines how much it will hurt us. The problem that is there is definitely there. But our mind can magnify the problem manifold. This is where the capacity to train our mind becomes vital. Uh, today is the uh, world has phenomenal scientific and technological progress by which we have gained large amount of control over the outer world. Just by pressing a few buttons, you can talk with anyone in any part of the world. Unfortunately, however, despite so much technological progress, there seems to be increased psychological distress. People are more and more tense, people need more and more mental health medicines, more and more people are suffering from anxiety, 
depression and what exactly why exactly is this happening specific causes can be many but if you go back to the starting point what i said the mind is like a it's like a inner screen and it's meant to act like a window to the outer world but it can also act like a tv where it takes us to the past and the future in various directions so now with technology providing us so many inputs from so many sources we have news we have we have movies we have sports we have so many social media by which you can connect with so many people so basically the mind acts less and less like a window to the world around us the world in front of us and it gets so many stimuli that makes the mind act more and more like a tv oh it goes over here it goes over there it goes over there and this distraction uh, it disempowers us from functioning effectively to be distracted is to be disempowered physically i may have strong energy to lift heavy weights and with that energy i can lift the weight but most of us we don't have to do a lot of physical work we have to do intellectual work at our jobs at our relationships think analyze how to speak how to speak but our capacity to focus gets eroded when the mind starts acting like a tv and that's why we can't function effectively so and the more and more the starts acting like a tv and showing negative images the more our agitation and distress happens the two main mental health problems that people face in today's world are depression and anxiety now in terms of this inner screen depression happens when the inner screen becomes a tv which starts replaying all the bad things that have happened to us in the past now see this person treated me like this this person did like this this person did like that this person did like that and anxiety happens when the inner screen acts like a tv which shows us the future this may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong that may go wrong just become panicky so one of my friends is a mental health counselor so he is available on the suicide intervention lines so he told me that mm, he got a case where a girl attempted suicide and the reason for that was she called her boyfriend and the boyfriend didn't pick up the call just because of that she thought and the thought train started off oh you know he didn't pick up the call that means he doesn't love me maybe he's with someone else maybe he rejected me you know this relationship will work out maybe in future others will also reject me i'll be alone throughout my life oh my be so miserable everybody around me will be happy i'll be miserable what is the use of living like this let me end my life now somebody not picking up a phone is a small thing but if the thought train starts off of anxiety it can lead to suicide means the mind kills the body basically the mind can hurt us hurt us when there is uh, anxiety or depression but suicide means the mind kills the body so this learning to manage what appears on our inner screen especially what we focus is vital for our well-being and spiritual growth helps us to do this so intelligence is intelligence can have many different meanings one simple meaning of intelligence is to see things in their proper perspective shila prabhupad who is the author of the bhagavad gita as it is a classic commentary on the bhagavad gita he defines intelligence this way intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective that means to understand what is more important what is less important and on the inner screen many many images will appear many thoughts will pop up but if our intelligence is sharp 
then we will be able to process which thought to give attention to and which thought to neglect. So intelligence means knowing which thought to contemplate and which thought to neglect. Suppose say we have come for an important meeting with, an, with somebody who is important for us and at that time some salesperson comes and starts talking with us, you know, please buy this product, buy this product, buy this product. Now we don't need, want to buy that product and anyway that can be done later. But at that time we start giving our time to that person, then our important meeting with, a, with this VIP will be lost. So similarly, we need to recognize what is important and that capacity comes this is what the intelligence provides. So intelligence here doesn't refer to simply the IQ score. IQ is measured uh, through the various tests and that refers to information processing capacity in terms of numbers and facts and figures and memory. All that is important. But that is only one aspect of intelligence. The essence of intelligence is not just processing information. The essence of intelligence is knowing which information is worth processing. Know what is worth doing and what is to be neglected. And this intelligence is what is nourished by spirituality. Spiritual knowledge helps us to understand, first of all, the inner dynamics. That there is an inner screen and many thoughts, many images come up on that inner screen. And I need to be careful to select what is important. So the more we study wisdom texts like the Bhagavad Gita, the more we understand the dynamics of the inner world, the more our intelligence becomes stronger. And strength of intelligence is not so much in terms of physical uh, muscular strength, but it's in terms of swiftness, sharpness, alertness. That when a thought image, when some thought comes up, the sharper our intelligence, the faster we evaluate. Do I need to pay attention to this? No. If not, we focus on what is important. First of all, with our intelligence, we come to know what is truly important. Otherwise, we'll just get carried away by this and that and everything else. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that we, the inner seer, is the soul. And the soul is an eternal part of the whole. The whole is the infinite consciousness, known in different, different traditions by different names. We know him by the name Krishna. Now, to the extent we connect with Krishna through devotion, to that extent we learn to oh, become calmer and more objective in evaluating what is happening on the inner screen. I'll conclude with two metaphors. First is, say a child is sitting and watching a horror movie. And initially they start watching the horror movie for enjoyment. But as the movie starts becoming more and more horrifying, and the child is identifying with that, and more they're identifying, more trembling, shrieking, sweating. Now the mother is right next to the child. But the child is not even aware that my mother is there. But if somehow the child reaches out and catches the hand of the mother, and the mother catches the hand, it becomes, oh, my mother is here. Immediately, a child will start feeling calm. They'll start feeling calm. So similarly for us, if we connect with Krishna, who is our supreme parent, that Whatever may be appearing on the inner screen, this is going wrong, that is going wrong, that is going wrong, this may happen, that may happen. But if you just connect with Krishna, that will calm us down. We may not even understand why it is calming us down. Say, when we, say, right now before this, we are chanting the mantra, we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. So, this Hare Krishna mantra is a, is a time honored sound vibration which connects our consciousness with Krishna. So chanting this mantra is like stretching our hand to catch the hand of our mother, to catch the hand of Krishna. Just doing this, 
it doesn't stop what is being displayed on the screen that may still go on but we don't identify it as real if that's happening out there i am here i am safe and then after that we can evaluate so both ways the bhagavad gita offers us firstly the intelligence by which we can evaluate what is coming on the screen and secondly it offers us access to a real reality beyond what is there on the screen and that access calms us down and that can also help us to process what whatever is happening in the outer world so the process of bhakti <laughs> is what enables us to connect with krishna the second metaphor i'll use it comes from the bhagavad gita in uh, one of its most vivid verses drawn from nature आपूर्यमचल प्रतिष्ठम समुद्रमाप प्रवेशमा प्रवेशांति काम कामी जस्ट एज रिवर्स फ्लो इन टू एन ओशन बट दे डोट डिस्रप दिन कम इन दिन एंड ओशन इज एब्सॉर्बिंगली माइंडेड those who are spiritual various thoughts desires emotions may come into it into them like a river coming in but they will not affect the spiritually advanced person the key here is that what is the river the, the rivers are coming into an ocean instead of the ocean if there were a small puddle over there or even a small pond and a river came into it what would happen this overflow and things would be devastated everything would be wrecked around it so similarly for us if our consciousness is like a ocean if we are internally fulfilled if we are internally connected with the one who is in like a oceanic reality who is the ocean of peace and joy that is krishna if he is present within our hearts if we are focused on him then whatever stimuli come in they will be like rivers they would agitate us much we will to deal with them but if we are attached to the small small things of this world then whatever it is we are attached to our consciousness gets concentrated on that and we could say our consciousness become like a puddle around that object i come from india which is a cricket mad country so each country of has its own sports mania so a few months ago there was a india pakistan cricket match in the finals of a world cup of a champions trophy and india was expected to win but india lost very badly so after that one boy came to me and he said last three days i have not been able to sleep so how could india lose this match like this so i said the players went to sleep why are you not able to sleep <laughs> so what has happened over here the match happened in england he was in india but his consciousness had become like a small puddle and in that the river of india losing that match flew in and everything got disrupted so whatever we are attached to our consciousness gets shaped by that and quite often in today's world where so many distractions come in from so many sources some stimulus comes up and we start dwelling on it and we get attached to it so so to become peaceful to be able to evaluate and process our inner world effectively we need to not just develop our intelligence not just connect with krishna but actually elevate our attachments the smaller the things that we are attached to the greater will be our greater will be our agitation when something goes wrong now if we are attached very much to one particular person we all need relationships we all need connections but there can be emotional dependency in relationships if we become too dependent on someone and then that person just looks at us disapprovingly that will give us a heart attack 
because we've become too dependent on that person. Yes, we want to have relationships, but the Bhagavad Gita tells us our primary relationship is with Krishna. If we connect with him through the process of bhakti, we make him our primary attachment. It is spiritual attachment, whereas most other attachments agitate us, the attachment to Krishna stabilizes us. Because he is the supreme, unchanging reality. He is always there with us in our own hearts as an aspect of the divine who accompanies us always. So by the process of bhakti, which involves chanting the holy names, which involves coming to spiritual programs like this, which involves studying the Bhagavad Gita, by all this, the more we make our attachment directed towards Krishna, the more our consciousness will expand from a puddle to an ocean. And as it expands to an ocean, the more we will be able to have the rivers of various stimuli coming into that ocean, but without disturbing us. The more we'll be able to process life's difficulties with intelligence and grace. We will know that, okay, even if this has happened, that has happened, Krishna is still in charge and he will bring good out of the bad. And that will help us to face life's difficulties without our mind aggravating those difficulties. Rather, we'll be able to calm ourselves down and deal with those difficulties with greater effectiveness, with greater constructiveness. And ultimately, the attachment to Krishna will take us to his eternal abode, where there is life and love eternal, where all our longing for lasting peace and joy is permanently and perfectly fulfilled. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on the topic of tapping the power of our thoughts with our intelligence. So understanding how our inner world works. I started with the example of that how the Bhagavad Gita personifies the mind. So what exactly is the mind? We did the thought experiment that we can see an inner screen, but we can't see the seer of that inner screen. The inner screen is the mind and the inner seer is the soul. So for normal perception, the inner screen needs to act like a window which shows us what's happening outside. But on the, on the screen of the mind, many different thoughts pop up. And because they appear inside us, we identify with them instead of identifying them. And we get carried away. So I talked about another metaphor of a train station. And there are many thought trains which are waiting inside the train station. And as soon as we hop into a train, it shoots off. If we get into a wrong train, we might uh, we might get agitated and go far away from what we wanted to do or where we wanted to go. So the outer, we don't respond to the outer reality. We respond to the inner representation of the outer reality. Like a, the sand is out there, but inside we see a mirage. So even when problems happen in our life, we respond not to the problem, but to the mental representation of the problem. And that's why so if I get a flu and it's, I just get resent, resenting that, then that resentment of reality hurts me more than the reality. So because the thoughts come inside us, we tend to think that they are wise, they are true, they are important and they are urgent. And because of that, we just get carried away. Like we are going for a, going somewhere and somebody comes and takes up six hours away from us, just talking with them. So the thoughts within us, they are expert storytellers. They'll completely captivate us and we'll not even realize what we are doing. So when the inner screen starts becoming like a TV that shows all the wrong things that have happened to us in the past, we get depression. When the inner screen becomes a TV that shows all the things that may go wrong in future, we get anxiety. Uh, how do we protect ourselves uh, through technology. We have got a lot of progress and comfort, but unfortunately technology has given us 
access to so many things in the outer world that that increases the chances of the inner skin acting like a movie and that's why we get more and more distracted to be distracted is to be disempowered you can't focus so i talked about three things three uh, measures for better managing our inner screen first is intelligence we just understand that everything that appears inside me is not me a thought can be just an event that happens in the inner world and thought can also refer to something that uh, we give a lot of contemplation to so every thought doesn't deserve thought <laughs> every thought doesn't need to be thought about in the very deep so this understanding of intelligence means to know things see things in their proper perspective which thoughts to contemplate and which to neglect so studying scriptures like the bhagavad gita equips our intelligence to become sharper and not get carried away by random thoughts popping up on our inner screen second i talk about is the divine connection like a child watching a horror movie just touches the mother and feels calm similarly if we connect with krishna through the process of bhakti through the chanting of his holy names through prayers through rem devotional remembrance then even if the inner screen is showing all kinds of unwanted things we will be calm because this is real krishna is there with me and thirdly talk about how uh, our <clears throat> what appears prominently on the inner screen uh, that is determined by our attachments so to the metaphor of the river coming into an ocean so if instead of a sorry oceans come rivers coming into an ocean so if instead of that is a pond or a puddle the rivers will devastate it so if our consciousness is attached to an oceanic object that is a supreme reality then the stimuli coming into our consciousness won't trouble us but if our consciousness is attached to small petty objects then our consciousness like a puddle or a pond it will get completely disrupted so like a cricket match being lost somewhere and a person becomes spending sleepless nights or <clears throat> somebody just somebody is emotionally dependent on someone else then one call phone call not being responded to making somebody suicide so we need relationships but we our defining relationship has to be a relationship with krishna then when we by the process of bhakti yoga make him our primary attachment then our consciousness is the geniac and then whatever ups and downs happen in life we which will inevitably happen we will get the undesirable and will not get the desirable but we won't aggravate that by our minds misrepresentations of the reality rather by the mind functioning objectively with our inner calmness and clarity we will be able to respond effectively to situations and go through a life journey as peacefully as possible and ultimately attain the destination that is beyond the distress of this world thank you very much hare krishna so does anyone have any questions actually kept on now and then after any of the kept on you can answer books So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ji ki, Gaur Bhakti Vinay ki, I Gaur Bhakti Manu. So we can all stand for the kirtan and for whoever on that is the biggest. I need to bring over seven minutes.